working. So well, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of the Americas, we're pleased to welcome you to this exciting discussion about whiteness in Latin America. Uh, this panel is the first of our series of event series about race and racism in the Americas that you can check out in our, on our website. I am personally thankful to Lamont Aydou, Erika Edwards, and Ignacio Aguilo for joining us for their time and always on also for the work in general. I truly admire them and, and I'm sure that this will be an enriching discussion for, for everyone today. Uh, the dynamic today will be, first we're going to have a round of interventions of around about 45, 50 minutes, and then we will open uh, the chat uh, for a Q&A. Please remain muted during the, the, the interventions. If, if you have any question, you can write it in the chat box and then I will read them uh, at the end of the, of the, of the discussion uh, to bring them to the minutes. Can we uh, open, uh, open the camera? Uh, I will just present briefly our speakers today. Erika Denise Edwards is an associate professor of Latin American history at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She has recently published the book Hiding in Plain Sight, Black Women, the Law and the Making of White Argentine and Republics, which is a gender analysis of Black er erasure and the construction of race in Argentina. It has won the 2021 Western Association of Women Historians Barbara Penny Kaner Book Award, the 2020 Association of Black Women. Okay. Uh, they don't want to listen to black, uh, No, I don't want to. Uh, uh, please remain. Um, I think I can mute everyone. Up. Okay. Um, the 2020, but I'm sorry, 2020 Association of Black Women Historians, um, Letitia Woods Brown Book Prize, and named one of the 2020 best books of Black history by Black Perspective. Edwards' research advocates for relearning of Argentinian Blacks' past and the region of anti-Blackness. Her advocacy extends to community engagement, where she currently serves as a member of the Board of the Director for Latin American Working for Achievement. Ignacio Aguilo is lecturer in Latin American Cultural Studies at the University of Manchester, where he's also co-director of the Center of Latin American and Caribbean Studies. He's the author of The Dark Unit of the Nation, published by the University of Wales in 2018, creditor of the cultures of anti-racism in Latin America of 2019, and of Culturales, Miradas Actuales sobre Poesía, Narrativa y Cultura Visual of 2019. Lamont Aidu is a Kaiser Family Associate Professor of Romance Studies at Duke University and co-editor of From Slavery to Freedom, Representation of Race and Freedom in the African Diaspora, Humanities Laboratory, and the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. He's the author of Slavery and Scene, Sex, Power, and Violence in Brazilian History of 2018, and editor of Lima Barreto, New Critical Perspective 2013, Emerging Dialogues on Machado, the Seas, 2016, and Lucifer and African Short Stories After Independence, The Colonial Destinies of 2021. So after that presentation, uh, we will start with a, a presentation of, of Eric Edwards. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this, I think, what will be an amazing conversation that we'll have. Uh, today, I want to thank Patricio again for the invitation, as well as the University College London Institute of the Americas um, for this invitation and opportunity to talk about whiteness. And in my case, I'll be focused mainly on Argentina. And this talk really is uh, going to help center, I guess, the roots of what I would consider to be whitening in this country. And um, in particularly, um, I hope uh, through the Q&A, we can also discuss the legacies of it. So um, as some of us know, June, 2021, uh, the current president of Argentina proclaimed Mexicans came from Indians, Brazilians came from the jungle, 
and our but we Argentines come from boats. This is was followed or had, has a precedent in regards to how um, presidents have viewed the country. Uh, just a few years earlier, in January 2018, uh, now ex-president Mauricio Macri stated, I think the association between Mercosur and the European Union is natural because in South America, we are all descendants of Europeans. And prior to that, in the 90s, uh, we have Carlos Menem, who um, I'm, I'm astounded when while visiting Howard University, or at least in the DC area, uh, proclaimed, and I quote, there are no blacks in Argentina, loosely um, quoting him, that is a Brazilian issue and or problem, however you want to translate it. But in each of these cases, what the presidents, ex and current, of Argentina, left or right, are ultimately doing is, again, pro promoting and, pro and continuing to, pro to put forward this notion that Argentina is a white country and very much an exception to the rest of what is Latin America. Now, at least in two of those in instances, it was for economic reasons and attempting to connect, for example, with the Spanish prime minister and or um, with the European Union, um, but still, in order to do so, it was to create this notion that we are essentially like you. There is no difference except for Argentina just happens to be located somewhere else outside of Europe. Um, in general, scholars have noted that the beginning or the origins of this white national narrative can be found mainly in at the end of the 19th century and or should I say the success of it with the the um, massive amount of European immigrations that came to Argentina and they've described this moment as being blancamiento which I largely agree with at least in terms of the successful shifting of the narrative of the nation which again pointing to another ex-president this quote of, if you want to see a black person, you need to go to Brazil, was ultimately assigned to uh, Domingo Sarmiento. But what I wanna do is um, look at the precursor to that. How do we get to that moment? And ultimately seeing this continued legacy of whiteness, the creation of it, the promotion of it, and more importantly, how it maintains itself throughout the early, uh, late 18th through the 19th century, um, and in particularly understanding this notion of institutionalized whitening. So looking at, and these are some of the interventions that I think my work really does, is by pushing it back to the late 18th century, we're really starting to understand that it was never a marked moment of Blanca Miento, but really a constant conversation of how Argentina will define itself, create itself, and make itself a white nation. The end of the late colonial period then, um, when we look at definitions of whiteness and blackness, and even what it means to be Indian, here's some common, or shall I say the characteristics that I found. To be white or to have that whiteness aspect was to have privilege, wealth, freedom, education. Blackness, however, was in many ways the antithesis. It's disadvantaged, it's impoverished, it's slavery, it's ignorance. And then we have this indigenous aspect that was constantly a reminder of a potentially previous notion of what was Argentina. And they fell into two categories, one in which they would become civilized, i.e. part of the urban sphere, and to remain quote unquote, these are not my words, uh, part of a barbarous state of existence. And so we have these three notions already coming forward already at the end of the 18th century. And we will see that this will continue throughout the 19th century. So really it's the marked moment of the Republican period that I want to really show how 
it whitening becomes solidified, not solidified, excuse me, institutionalized and continues in and allows for this massive notion of European immigration as being the, the, the final solution or at least the only solution to create a successful modern state. It is during the Republican period that we will see um, key factors of it being, being a citizen, having education, and as well as nomenclature and labels shifting that will allow us to see whitening truly taking hold. Again, this is previously to the end of the 19th century, and as I want to stress the Republican period in which Argentina, there's various republics at this point. So in my case, what I'm going to focus on primarily is the Cordobese Republic. What is key for the Republican period then is the definition and understanding of what is freedom. Freedom is what defines it and creates a different reality than its colonial past. And so being a free citizen, having formal education, and of course then removing itself from previous caste labels are what are key to these institutionalized whitening moments. Citizenship, especially in the Cordobese constitution, was defined as being free and being a man. And ultimately, it furthermore made it very clear that that would be the standard understanding of identity. And I say this because in the definition, it does not state that you have to be white, that you have to be black, or that you have to be indigenous and or any of the previous casta labels. Instead, there's nothing mentioned in terms of the, the, the actual definition of being a citizen but they will add layers onto the stipulations of citizenship for those that are of African descent. Those of African descent, for example, in order to vote, you have to be two generations removed from slavery. And in order to run for office, four generations removed from slavery. So already you're seeing that this notion of blackness and citizenship is not the same. There are stipulations and paths that they have to move forward in order to become a citizen. Another aspect in terms of this notion of the Republican period and freedom is education. And education was key, especially for those that were newly emancipated. And what I found in Cordoba through my own work was a school for girls that was opened up for just free African descendants, other um, formerly labeled caste girls, as well as, of course, um, formerly, labeled, formerly labeled Spanish girls. It is this moment of formal education that creates then at least a unified understanding of what is ideal. Now, because of the citizenship is defined as being a male, um, the goal then for these girls were to learn these particular skills, sets, ideology, civility, morality, obedience, and teach that then to their children, i.e. their sons who would then become the next generation of citizens. <clears throat> and then lastly, what I wanna talk about is nomenclature. And in particular, how that movement away from blackness and indigenous and even um, whiteness starts to solidify in some way, shape or form. First and foremost, the notion of being a Spaniard now is a negative, has a negative connotation. So we're going to see, or at least I see specifically in Cordoba, that Blanco replaces Spaniard or Espanol in the census. And that is key then to really solidifying this notion of what, is, what was considered to be privilege and status and freedom is now going to have literally not just a title of, of being a Spaniard or someone who's um, having that privilege of being a peninsular in a previous life or having someone who was in their family, but now it's the whiteness, literally the phenotype, the color of whiteness now is being tied to, to that privilege. And so I would say that would be the true moment where we're going to see institutionalized whitening really spring forward because now they're referring to themselves as being Blanco. But we also see, as I mentioned, especially in Cordoba, 
of formally labeled castas um, such as Negro, Mulato, Moreno, Zambo, now being collapsed into a, a, a label known as Pardo. I want to stress this is something different than other parts of Argentina. And that is why we constantly, as we look at and understanding whiteness, we need to acknowledge that that also has a different connotations throughout um, the, the region of the Rio de la Plata. So Pardo's, especially during the Republican period in Cordoba, now will take hold and have an indiscriminate notion of anyone who is not white. And I see this through the census data again. So by the 1832, <clears throat> essentially half the population is Pardo, half the population is Blanco or Noble at times as they would refer to themselves. So we're seeing this collapse and this movement away from blackness, right? And away from indigenousness because we do not find a lot of Indian uh, labels or the label Indian being Indio, excuse me, being used except for in 1840 because they recently annexed an area um, that was that had a, a large majority of indigenous peoples. But as I stress, Pardo still has connotations of blackness, but that would be more in the littoral, mainly Buenos Aires. And that I think is due to the fact that there is a, still a constant flow of, of Africans, um, especially through the, the slave trade at the beginning of the 19th century. Still, if we were to shift very briefly to the littoral, they too have this moment and movement away from blackness and also attempting to extol whiteness. And that's through the term trigenio, wheat colored, which was also used for African descendants as well as darker skin European immigrants, as we all find throughout the 19th century. And then what I find also interesting and in part, and I hope we continue to have this conversation is the term criollo. Criollo being now used formally in the colonial period to mean essentially American born, black or white at times. Um, but now criollo is now going to be transferred to and used for those that were considered civilized indigenous peoples. And again, representing a pre-immigrant past, but not quite in terms of the race. So that is something else we're seeing in terms of this movement away from being Indian and Black and or Spaniard. These nomenclatures, I think, also allow for us to see that whiteness is essentially this removal away from Blackness. But with a caveat, of course, that not everyone can become truly white. Um, that has to be, and as we will see, an outside project. And that's what I think really then solidifies and why we need to continue to interrogate the previous moments of Blanca previous moments before Blanca Miento, before we can really then see how Blanca Miento truly the institutionalized the institutionalization of whitening really taking hold at the end of the 19th century vis-a-vis -vis Blanca Miento with an outside source of capital that is human capital, that is European immigrants. And I find it interesting that even still today, when we think about, um, and you'll hear it referred to as the melting pot, right? The Cristobal of, of Razas, um, I think it's, I may, I may be wrong with that translation, I apologize, but the melting pot of, 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 of people coming together is not, as some of us may see in the United States, where we think of everybody coming together. It is the immigrants mixing together to then form the Argentine. So again, we see this outside influence as being the savior, what is to be extolled, and clearly continues to be the national image of how Argentina wants to perpetuate itself and, and promote itself to, to um, to the outside and of course to, amongst themselves. And what I also wanna stress is I'm, I'm wrapping up because I know we have a lot of uh, two other people that need to go, um, is that this notion then of the outside of the immigrant then becomes the standard. It becomes the understood uh, underlying, understand, uh, underlying identity upon which everyone else is judged 
as being different. So either you're a part of this and have this immigrant um, background, uh, or you are Argentine, but not, not part of this whitening aspect. And you see that also this, uh, there's a erasure that takes place too at that moment as well. The com concept, excuse me, of race starts to disappear. And this erasure is, is what really then allows for, as we many of us have heard, there are no hay negros, no hay indios. And really what it, it allows for then is, is, is this, even, excuse me, even though it allows for the stopping of the conversation of race, it just transfers over into questions of class. And so we're still seeing, right, that there are, of course, African descendants, indigenous descendants, but to try and categorize them into a different race would mean for us to have to re reconceptualize what is Argentina. And that I think is a conversation that for many Argentines is still a very difficult one and one that they don't want to have. Um, so I will stop there as I, I would hope that we'll continue. I think Ignacio will definitely have some good things to say about race and, and class and in the 20th and 21st century in Argentina. Um, but yeah, I just want us to think about essentially the periodization, nomenclature, the leg legacy of nomenclature. We hear these, these terms, morocho, another one being uh, more, even more present. Um, and what does that mean for us when we think about whiteness? Whiteness to me is this movement away from being Indian and movement away from being black and ultimately a standardization of identity. Thank you. Well, yes. Um, well, now we will continue with Lament I do I do a presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, tuning in today. And um, I obviously I want to thank uh, Patricio for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you so much to UCL. Um, thank you, obviously, Dr. Edwards, for that wonderful presentation um, and for really kind of anchoring um, the discussion. Um, I want to start off um, a little bit. I'm going to be talking about Brazil. So I'm a scholar of race, gender, and sexuality in Brazil. Um, but I want to start off with just kind of uh, kind of my earlier thinking about and how I got to my research. And one of the biggest questions that I tried to understand earlier on um, was one, um, when I first started learning about Brazil, um, Brazil, I knew uh, about this thing called the myth of racial democracy, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, um, that Brazil was uh, this mixed race country that was not racist, okay? Um, and early on, I was really interested in that, and I'm gonna talk about that today, um, but I was really interested in that myth um, and how that myth has kind of stuck around. Um, but the paradox of that is that Brazil in 1888 was the last country in the Western hemisphere to abolish slavery. So one of the things that I was really trying to, really sort of perplexed me that that sort of, there was a disconnect uh, in my mind earlier on as a graduate student when I was studying Brazil, beginning to study Brazil, um, how is it that this country um, could be um, anti-racist, um, could use its mixed race population um, as evidence of, a, of the absence of racism, but also be the last country in the Western hemisphere to abolish slavery? Um, so that's one, of the, that's one of the big questions, okay? And, um, and I wanna, I'm talking about, I'm gonna be talking about, my research is particularly on this whole idea of mixing of races, okay? So I think Dr. Edwards, um, when she was talking about nomenclature and naming, that's what I kind of seek to do in my work. And so I'm just going to, when we think about race and racial mixture in Latin America, oftentimes we use these terms like whitening. We use terms like miscegenation. We use terms like embranquecimiento, okay? We use terms like mestizaje or miscigenation, okay? Um, and I'm, 
I want us to really think about today um, what's beneath those terms, okay? What's beneath those terms and how have they sort of frame the national mythology? What's beneath those terms? What are those terms obscuring historically, okay? Um, and I think that I'm, I'm so excited that we're having this conversation because um, it is important for all of us who study um, Latin America to really do a real examination of what lies beneath those terms. And we know that every country in Latin America has this kind of what Doris Summers called a foundational fiction, okay, about uh, the mixing of the Indian, the black, okay, the European, okay. Um, but we often see missing, um, and what my research is really concerned about, where is the violence in that encounter, okay? The historical archive, we know that um, colonialism and slavery, um, well, I mean, according to the mythology, they, they were benevolent institutions in some way, but we know that those institutions were rooted in violence, okay? And I want to us to sort of think about um, the longevity of this language to sort of frame race in Latin America, okay? Um, so whitening, whiteness, embranquecimiento, um, miscigenação, what's behind that? Um, and so um, I want to, I think that Dr. Edwards made me sort of think about, um, you know, what's really important for us in this particular moment, I'm going to go talk particularly about slavery and because I sort of see the beginning of this sort of language around um, obscuring um, sexual violence um, and sanitizing it linguistically and also kind of in the archive as being part of the slavery project in Latin America. Um, but when we think about when we think about whitening or whiteness and white supremacy, we have to think about that um, and I'm going to talk about Brazil. So Brazil um, became uh, received, you know, fought, uh, became independent in 1822. Um, slavery was abolished in 1888. What's really important about um, independence in Latin America, and I always tell my students, is that um, independence was a moment, not just in Brazil, Argentina, but also like throughout the Americas. Um, independence was a moment for the countries to decide who they wanted to be, okay? No longer being a colonial power, but it was a moment in which they could imagine themselves or reimagine themselves outside of being a colonial entity. So this tells us a lot about, um, you know, who these countries were, the sort of the origins of, when we think about sort of the 19th century, the 19th century becomes a very defining moment. There's lots of stuff happening in the 19th century. The, the advent of study of race in the late 19th century, we see the emergence of homosexuality um, as, a, as a being studied um, and being named. Um, but these countries sort of began sort of thinking about who they want to be. And they're not only defining themselves in terms of um, nationalistic terms, but they're also defining their racial identity. Um, they're defining their racial identity and that's really essential here because we have, um, and, and also they are also narrating themselves, how they want to project themselves to the outside world, okay? Um, what they want to be recognized, what they don't want to be recognized, okay? So that's really important here. Um, and oftentimes what we see is at that particular moment, that's very curious, we know that Latin America, although all of the countries say that we are a mixture of Indian, Black, European, there is a moment in which when we see countries sort of transitioning into independence, um, uh, modernity, this transition becomes inherently um, rooted in white supremacy, okay? So we have the paradox. The paradox of Latin America is the existence, we know it's documented, of these, uh, of Black people in Latin America, of Native people in Latin America. Yet we see these discourses and not only discourses, but um, movements, white supremacist movements, okay? Um, and it's really fascinating, but we see these white supremacist movements. So we see the emergence of nation um, with white supremacy. And then we still have the very existence of a black population in Brazil, a black population throughout most of Latin America. But in discourse, okay, um, there is um, 
there is essentially this idea of wanting to remove black people, wanting to erase them, literally, okay, literally, um, and also to remove them from the archive and essentially rewrite the history of slavery. And not only rewrite the history of slavery, but particularly around the, the sort of the discourse of the narrative of what really actually happened in the interracial encounter, the, 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 the encounter between the colonizer um, and the, the native, when, and the, the slave woman, the slave man, and the slave master, um, that, that violence that we often, what's interesting is that oftentimes when we think about slavery, we conflate this violence of slavery with the United States. We know that that slavery was a, an institution that used sexual violence as a way of control, of debasement, um, but also in this particular instance, we need to sort of think about how um, sexual violence was even used as part of nation making. Okay, and why has that been? Why has that been? Why are we not talking? Why has that been erased? Why has that been erased from the record? Because often, what we need to sort of think about also is that um, sexual violence, or this idea of the myth of racial democracy. All of the I would argue that most countries in Latin America have it has in some degree its own sort of myth of racial democracy, this whole idea of the mixture, okay? Um, but does that allow, does that allow for a total cost accounting of the violations of, that really took place to black and native bodies? And I'm gonna talk about um, today, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start off with, um, I'm going to try to, Patricio, if I lose, if I, if I start going over time, please stop me. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to have my timer here, but you know, uh, you help me out too. Um, so I'm just going to start off by, um, by sort of, I want to, I'm going to use a quote um, by Sojourner Truth. Um, some of, many of you may know Sojourner Truth. Um, she wrote one of the most famous slave narratives, um, I think, in the world. Um, but Sojourner Truth um, wrote, published her slave narrative in 1850. Um, and really, this was kind of the inspiration behind the, the title of my, um, my first single authored book. But I want us to really sort of think about it. Um, I think she helps us to kind of sort of think about how um, violence was obscured in the archive. Um, just, just a quick um, quote, she says, oh, who has conceived the breadth and depth of this putrescent plague spot? Perhaps the pioneers in the slaves cause will be much surprised as any to find without all their, with all their looking, there remains so much unseen. So essentially, I wanna just talk about that for a second. Um, so Journey of Truth, um, slave narratives are, you know, uh, Dr. Edwards is a historian. Um, um, doc, um, slave narratives are essential for giving us, we have firsthand accounts of, um, of the slave experience. And I want to, um, what's interesting here um, for us to think about is that she's telling us, even though as she, in the books, in her narrative, she narrates incidents in her life, she's telling us that there remains, slavery has secrets that weren't actually documented. Okay, slavery has secrets. Okay, um, we will never know the full story. Okay, so a lot of the work when we so we need to sort of think that when we approach the archive, when I'm approaching the archive, we have to approach that sort of thinking about what she said. There remains so much unseen. So we are dealing with when we talk about um, the the history of slavery and colonialism in Latin America. We are dealing with essentially. Um, the element, the dimension of the unseen, the undocumented, okay? Um, and that's, that is really important here. Um, I'm just going to start to read. Sexual violence took on forms of humiliation, debasements that to this day have been historically relegated to the realm of the unspeakable. Enslaved men and women suffered most times in silence, the pleasures of white masters that were, were materialized through physical acts that were it, at a time not socially or legally definable. Slaves were victims of sexual violence acts, practices, crimes that were simply called sin, the impossible, the unnatural, the unimaginable, oftentimes the non-existent. The habitual focus on, on difference in heteronormative reproductive sex and cause us to overlook 
forms of sex and racial violence that do not fit neatly into the no story that we know or tell about slavery. These acts of racially motivated sexual violence were committed with a cognizance they fell outside paradigms of commonplace forms of slave, uh, slave bodily exploitation. We are dealing with the reality that um, we are dealing with the reality that there were forms of violence that were essentially um, enacted against slaves that were um, relegated to the realm of the unspeakable and that were essentially um, did not make it into the narrative. And that's what I, that's what my work really focuses on. Um, I'm going to focus on um, the idea of widespread, widespread interracial sex was central to the construction of Brazilian racial exceptionalism and the myth of racial democracy. Sex and its traditional connection to intimacy and interracial reproduction were used to create a racially complex society as an effective weapon of subjugation for the enslaved. Sex was attributed a transcendental meaning by many of the nation's white elite and racial theorists. That is, sex and reproduction had the capacity to erase barriers and served as proof that race could be and had been transcended. This conceptualization of sex and its connection to race was central to Portuguese colonialism and became the very basis of Brazilian racial exceptionism and the, the myth of racial democracy. The silencing and sanitization of the nation's history of rape, sexual violence, and abuse during slavery and its aftermath laid the foundation for an enduring, enduring legacy of erasure that created the illusion of equality and racial progressivism, while in reality solidifying an anti-Black racist system that preserved white male supremacy in Brazil's past and present. So I just want to just focus on how um, it's not only the, the, the practice, we, we need to sort of think about how the story of um, sexual violence, what was done with it, okay? What was done with it and how that it was essential to package that history in a particular way as part of these, the sort of the, the story that the nations wanted to tell about themselves when we get to the 19th century, okay? When we get to the, so we get into this independence moment. Um, what happened, okay? Um, what happened to that history? That erasing that history was essential, or sort of the whitening of that history was essential to um, defining the very, um, um, the very, um, the very core of what we know as sort of Brazilian national identity or Argentinian or Cuban national identity. Um, so, um, and also, I just want to say um, that it's important for us to sort of think about that each colonial power. Um, um, narrated sort of the interracial encounter very differently. Sort of the English dealt with it in a very particular in a very particular way. We see the legacies of that in the United States. The Spanish and the Portuguese um, had a very a different way, um, which is essentially why we sort of see this sort of language of mestizaje, miscigenación. So when we sort of think about, um, we have to sort of think about um, the colonial powers, how they colonized, okay? How they use sex as a form of colonization, okay? how they use sex as a form of colonization, we are left with sort of the residue of that. Um, we're left with the residue of that. And that sort of frames sort of what we know and what we don't know about um, sexual violence and interracial sexual violence under slavery. Um, I just wanna jump really quickly to um, um, the myth of racial democracy that I know many of you probably in the room know about. Um, already. So most of the time it is associated with Gilberto Freire. One of the things that I want to dispute right away is that Gilberto Freire did not create the myth of racial democracy. So I just want to, I just want to say that. So he did not, um, he did not uh, create the myth of racial democracy. But what Freire did in his work um, was uh, in this interdisciplinary work, Casa Grande Senzala, or the masters and the slaves, um, is that he argued that uh, what made Brazil so exceptional was precisely its miscegenation. So I just, okay, I, I, it was, somebody muted me. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, he argued, he claimed that the absence of racism in Brazil was due to the nation's history of peaceful miscegenation between the European um, indigenous and African peoples which he held to be one of the country's defining characteristics, especially in contrast to the segregationist system that existed in the United States. Freire, like many of his predecessors, um, and I wanna say that Freire drew on the works of many thinkers of that time. Um, uh, this was, um, I wanna talk, I wanna say that um, 
uh, many during the sort of the, the abolitionist debates, they were so when they were thinking about abolishing slavery, um, they were thinking about um, miscegenation, um, sexual violence, particularly. They were thinking about miscegenation, um, um, Brazil's miscegenation, and they were they were thinking about it in relation to how the U.S. was actually talking about. Um, um, how the U.S. was actually talking about um, race mixture, um, and so one is so Brazil kind of saw itself saw its race mixture as something that um, was politically useful. Okay, um, and for many people, um, and for many people, um, that was a reason why they didn't need to abolish slavery. But also, Brazil also used it in a particular way um, in the 19th century um, as a way of sort of defining it as its uniqueness. Okay, and so once we get into the 20th century, so this is so it's, it was the interracial mixture, and particularly how sex happened under slavery under and, and colonialism was something that made Brazil exceptional. Okay, in relation to um, in relation to other countries in the the Americas. Um, I just want to, I think I'm, I'm getting nearing, uh, I just want to just wrap up and get to everything. But um, so miscegenation and Fidesz was inherited from the Portuguese colonizers and had created a society that was both racially and sexually fluid. Sexual contact between the races created a distinct sense of intimacy among all of the nation's people. Interracial sex and, and became a crit critical to defining the Brazilian dif difference. But then here's the key point. It only it not only defined the Brazilian difference, but it became essential to sustaining uniquely Brazilian forms of inequality. Okay, so when we think about any racial inequality in Brazil, we have to go back and think about um, the history of, um, of of race mixture because that essentially sort of, sort of is, I, I sort of locate that as being essential to understanding um, um, uh, racial inequality. So we have to understand sort of like what was done with that history to understand racial, um, the dynamics of, uh, of race today. Political and national mythology constructed in or through the body is indeed the most enduring because with procreation comes the reproduction of the body's meaning and visibility in relation to national myth. Um, and so I just wanna end with that because I wanna say uh, essentially um, that um, the reproduction, reproduction is, um, and one of the reasons I've actually gotten away from it in my work um, is that um, reproduction, interracial reproduction, um, particularly, um, has been essential to sustaining the idea, um, or sort of that was essential to the construction of that mythology, defining mixed race bodies, okay, projecting a particular meaning onto mixed race bodies, okay, as part of this, uh, as part of this history, and as part of this sort of um, this. Um, this sort of benevolent history between the um, the white colonizer and the slave woman and the um, and the, um, the 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 indigenous um, and so I just want to I just want to I think it's I I just want to end by saying that um, it's important for us when we sort of think about um, whiteness or whitening um, in Latin America um, to go back and sort of go back and sort of really think about what truth told us. What lies in the unseen, okay? What lies in the unseen? Um, what lies in the unseen and particularly what's there that, we, that is particularly useful for us to sort of really think about and reimagine um, social justice, racial justice um, in the region more broadly. Um, and so I'm just going to end with that. Um, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Um, well, it's a uh, uh, Eric and Lamont are tough acts to follow, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think I'm going to draw a lot of me on on your presentations to to articulate mine because I think there are many very useful and interesting ideas that I would like to um, establish a dialogue with. Is it okay if I share my screen because I have a couple of images? Yeah, Patricia. Okay. So, start. so um, can you see this? For there, uh, that, that, that photo, the youth on the left is a 19 year old Fernando Y. Sosa, who was beaten to death in the small hours of the, of the morning on the 18th of January, 2020 in a, a outside a nightclub in a summer resort in, in Argentina, in, in Pinamar. 
And probably some of you might be familiar with this crime because it ignited a, a, a big uh, public debate, motivated mainly by the fact that the uh, perpetrators were a group of young male rugby players. In the media and social network, uh, networks, uh, multiple voices refer to uh, violent incidents by male rugby players against men from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and women. However, with very few exceptions, um, the crime did not inspire a similar debate about racism and white supremacy. This at, at first might seem uh, unusual given that according to several witness, uh, witnesses, one of the rugby players yelled Negro de Mierda at Fernando while he kicked him on the floor. Most news outlets simply interpreted uh, uh, this, this insult as a classist uh, rant or classist, classist uh, offense, given that by Sosa came from a working class family. Uh, he was the son of Paraguayan immigrants who work as care, uh, caretakers. And, and as Alejandro Mamami uh, from the collective Identia Marron put it, the murder made Argentines talk of patriarchy, about violence in sport, but we were unable to talk about racism despite it being 10 white boys against one who was not. So this silence around racism is not so strange if we consider the persistence of, of this widespread understanding of the Argentine national body as homogeneously white and European. And Erica referred to that when she, she mentioned these this, uh, statements by uh, Alberto Fernandez, before that Mauricio Macri, etc. Um, so because in principle, the national body would be, is, is according to this narrative, homogeneously white and European. I think both terms, it's, it's, they are related. It's important to, 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 to relate them, but at the same time, they're not the same, right? Because in Argentina, many people will say, los argentinos somos blancos, eh, somos europeos, perdón, but very few will say somos blancos. They, very few will use actually that, that racial uh, term. So because in Argentina, everybody comes from the, everybody came from the ship, as Alberto Fernandez uh, put it, uh, Macri, Lito Nevia, and, and, and uh, um, et cetera. Uh, so when there are like references to race in, in language, um, um, what people interpret, not people, but what is usually interpreted is that actually that language is elliptically expressing opposition conflicts and prejudices prejudice that are mostly socioeconomic and to an extent also political, it has to do with the history of Peronism in Argentina. So the usage of the term negro in, in Argentina is, is a good example of that. It's, it's very common, but only, but mainly restricted to everyday oral language, right? It's, it's, and it's usually uh, taken not as a reference to one's African ancestry, but actually as, as, as a classist or is seen as a classist disapproval of the alleged vulgarity and socially uh, unacceptable behavior that uh, the middle class attributes to the lower class. An example of that is Bobby Chocopar is one of Argentina's leading right-wing radio, radio show hosts, and he's known for his rants uh, on low-class protesters and social welfare recipients, whom he describes many times as negros de mierda que tenemos que mantener los que trabajamos. Yet when he was uh, kind of accused of racist remarks, he defended himself by saying, uh, no me refería al color de piel. Ellos son negros, pero negros de pensamiento, personas oscuras. El negro de acá no sabes de antemano que es negro. And, and I, I ha you have to believe me, I had to heavily edit that statement because it was much more offensive. And that tells a lot about Bobby Chico But Anyway, it also tells a lot about how many people interpret the use of, 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 of racial language in Argentina. What is usually sidelined in this traditional interpretation of, 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 of Negro as a classes insult would, is, is both by the right, but also to, by some elements from the, from the progressive sector, is that the majority of lower class, in, of the lower class in Argentina has no white features. And, and, and uh, I think um, perhaps one could venture that they will be considered mestizos in other countries, right? Um, in recent years, these narratives of whiteness and racial homogeneity and Europeanness have been the subject of growing criticism. And, 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 and as Erika explained, uh, uh, her research actually demonstrates uh, how what it took place was a process of invisibilization, right, of, of non whiteness, the, how non white people were pressured into kind of embracing an undifferentiated uh, model of citizenship that was 
uh, although it was raceless in theory, it was predicated on the white and European um, character of, of, of the national population, right? But at the same time, this was an ideal of Argentineness that was only attainable for those who were, uh, who were non-white in a very precarious way and under the conditions of ethnic backgrounds and traditions were belittled. Uh, so what we have here is a systematic invisibilization of, 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 of indigenous Afro and non-white people and, and that resonates with what Lamonte was saying about the unseen, right? And I want to add an element to that because I thought it's a very interesting idea and I want to, to, to focus on the unseen but I also want to talk about the hyper visibilization of non whiteness in the Argentine racial formation because I think for the case of Afro, we have a systematic invisibilization. But for example, when we look at indigenous people, in principle, Argentina is presented as a country in which uh, indigenous populations are very minimal or, or non existent. Even in, the left, uh, 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 in sectors of the left, until recently, it was said that indigenous were kind of killed in the 19th century. But at the same time, some, we have things like this. I don't know if you can see this. These are two kind of art um, headlines from La Nación and Clarín, two of the main newspapers in Argentina. Actually, Clarín is the most kind of widely read. And one is from 2017, the other one is from this Monday, actually. And in both, they talk about the Mapuche threat in Patagonia, right? Um, a group of Mapuche ram, que en la zona tienen vilo a la Patagonia, and the other one on the, on the bottom, we see how. Uh, the governor of Rio Negro is asking the president for, for help for, for their forces. So Argentina is a country without indigenous people, but suddenly we have indigenous people who are like almost the Taliban, no? about to take over. So it's, it's a, it's a hyper-visibilization. So we have this dynamic system in which we usually non whiteness is invisibilized, invisibilized, but we have momentary and strategic instances of hyper-visibilization when this is required by the status quo particularly to advance the repressive apparatus of the state. And this is a clear example. No? They're asking for the governor to send federal forces to say gendarmería, which is like a sort of military police. And the same is, is can be said about the Negros. Adamoki has a very interesting uh, phrase. He says, uh, Argentina is a país in negro, pero está lleno de negros molestando, que no, no dejan transitar por la ciudad. And, 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 and we have the, this uh, similar uh, structure of he, uh, invisibilization and hyper visibilization. You now, the, the Negros are the sectores populares, are the what we could say el pueblo. Although in Argentina, obviously, when we talk about el pueblo, there is a very a, a big Peronist kind of overtone there. But um, here we have ha, the, the idea of, of uh, uh, this narrative of Europeanness and, 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 and whiteness that is constantly, uh, I wouldn't say challenged, but it's constantly destabilized by the, the, the presence of the bodies, of the, the physical appearance that acts as a reminder of a social di difference that is observable yet denied. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a homogeneously white and Europeanized society, which is advanced as an undisputable reality by the dominant white sectors, is continuously contradicted by the presence of the multiplicity of bodies that do not conform to this conception of the nation. So uh, for a white middle class Argentina, Argent Argentine, well, that person could say, no, venimos de los barcos, but that person goes to the supermarket or has somebody come into their house to clean or, or whatever. They, 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 these people clearly don't come from the ships, right? So there is this kind of very visible difference that actually is silence or is, 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 um, is it remains an uter. I, I, I don't know how to say in, in English, but it has to do with the plane of enunciation. It's not enuncia, right? Uh, so and this, to an extent, reproduces racism because what we have is, a, is, is the, the dynamics of social class because in principle, the dynamics of social class mask racial tensions. So every time there are racial tensions, they are explained as actual class-based tensions. The least can deny this, the existence of structural racism, while at the same time they perpetuate it. And I think this, this uh, comic strip is, is a good example of that. Uh, what you can see is uh, this white guy with the, with the jersey of the Chicago Bulls, and actually he has a number 23, which I think is Michael Jordan's number. Black Lives Matter, very solemn about it. 
And then we have this, this, this dark skin street vendor with the, the, dish, the jersey of, of Boca Juniors, which is the most popular, stereotypically popular team. Although Macri was the president of Boca Juniors, so the idea of Boca Juniors as the, the, the team of the people is, we can discuss it, but it's stereotypically popular, right? And the guy kind of freaks out and calls the police. No? So, so we have the, here how for the Argentine, Argentinian white middle, the Argentine white middle and upper class uh, racism is a problem of other countries that actually needs to be repudiated, but that at the same time they reinforce the existence of racism against, against the, the negro populares, to put, it, to put it somehow. So I think it's interesting to, to look at what is seen and seen, but also what is being said and what is not being said. Um, there is a difference there that is visible in, in the street, in the public space, but it's not talked about, right? And I think this is another interesting example, again, from coming from rugby. This is, uh, this is the story of, of Tomas, who in November, this is a kid called Tomas. Tomas, in November 2016, the media reported that this teenager from San Isidro, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Buenos Aires, had encouraged Javier, a boy arrested for breaking into his house, to join a rugby team made up of uh, made up of prison inmates that promotes rehabilitation through sport. So the, the news was presented as an example of, of citizenship, and the news were in many newspapers, right? Uh, in, uh, including the photograph. And I think this illustrates against the mechanisms of racism in Argentina in the sense that the teenager's physical difference in skin and hair color, facial features, and other traits that are often seen as racial signifiers is clearly visible and yet wholly omitted in the narrative of the news media. There were stories about how the, the, the Javier, the, 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 the kid who was in prison, had to struggle with poverty growing up in the slums, no reference to racism. And another interesting uh, thing about this is that in all the newspapers where the story and the photo was uh, were, were, were reproduced, there was no caption explaining who was who, who was Javier and who was Tomas. And probably this was because most Argentinians will know that the dark-skinned kid was the one in prison and the white kid was the one who was robbed and who lived in this very wealthy kind of neighborhood, right? So it was like explaining the obvious to an extent. But this omission is precisely not because of political correctness of, of post-racial rhetoric, but rather to the fact that in public discourse, ethno-racial difference is never presented as defining social hierarchy. So race continues to be codified in the language of class and space, as, as Erika was, was saying. Uh, and, uh, or, or both, actually, in terms like uh, Negro and, and, and Negro Vigero, which reference to the slums or villas, which are massively inhabited by non-white people. So as seen in the slur, Negro de Mierda shouted at, at the other kid uh, by Sosa, it is only in everyday and informal interaction that race is spoken, and it's spoken as racism, as abuse, as offense. However, this racism is, racism is quickly downplayed uh, in public discourse when it presented as class-based offense or simply ignored, which again points to the question of not just what is visibilized, but also what is being said. Okay? And this also affects the urban poor, given that they don't usually uh, self-identify according to established ethno-racial categories, even though most, most Negro populares have as indigenous and, and Afro as ancestry. They can trace their ancestry, ancestry to, to these groups. Again, for many of them, race is expressed elliptically. For example, low-class individuals might refer pejoratively to middle and upper-class people as rubios or even describe themselves as negros. But this does not imply a race-based understanding of social conflict or a self-identification as a racial minority as we can find in other contexts. Actually, they might think that in Argentina, there are no significant racial differences as conceptualized in other societies, like, for example, the United States. This is because even though whiteness was imposed as the dominant modality of national belonging during the, the, the 20th century, or perhaps earlier, right? as Erika was saying, that it's established, it, it starts to be established during the 19th century, the Republican period, this was done as a cause of a very loose and stable understanding of whiteness, one, one that could simultaneously interpolate all nationals and also maintain race-based discrimination. This is something that Damoski has talked a lot. And actually it resonates with mestizaje, how mestizaje works. Peter Way has uh, an interesting book about 
and Colombian music, which she talks about how mestizaje has to harmonize the, the need to reinforce difference, but at the same time to try to integrate. So it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, dynamics. Um, so um, in this framework, I, I argue that negative popularities can only aspire to a very degraded whiteness, which works not only in affirm and affirmative ways, like I'm, I am white, but in a negative one, way. So I'm not not white, right? It's still, even in this limited form, whiteness can work as a promise of social inclusion for the masses, which explains, explains part of its potency as a form of national identity. Whiteness is not only a system of racial oppression, it is a system of racial oppression, but it is also a system that can mobilize the affective energies of those who are excluded by it or inhabit the fringes between whiteness and non-whiteness. And Gaston Gordillo has, has worked on this, on uh, the affective elements of, of Argentinian whiteness. Because this debased whiteness allows distancing, distancing, albeit temporarily and precariously, from the stigma of being deemed known white, poor people who don't ascribe to a very kind of a specific kind of ethno-racial identity like Afro indigenous, but who also suffer structural racism can at times be their strident defendants uh, as it allows from transferring the, the stigma to others more vulnerable ones. For example, there was an occupation of, of a park in 2010 in the, in the Americano Park by homeless people from uh, mainly migrants from Bolivia and Paraguay. And the inhabitants of public housing complexes in Villa Lugano and Villa Soldati organized armed, armed groups to attack the, the trespassers, arguing that they did not want a new shanty town in the vicinity and that the authorities were not doing enough to expel them. I'm about to finish. These arguments were uh, accompanied by racist, racist slurs. For example, one of the attackers complained to a journalist from the newspaper Página 12, vienen a hacerles reportajes a estos negros de mierda y nadie habla con nosotros. Yet the people from these places, from Soldat in Lugano, are, um, these are not wealthy white neighborhoods and their dwellers who complain about negros might be considered negros too by other kind of sectors of, of, of society. But at the same time, as in time, whiteness, because of its own kind of, we'll say, with this, this inclusive, exclusive dynamics, also allows for spaces to challenge it, uh, spaces to negotiate and counter racism, but not necessarily in explicit anti racist ways uh, or, or framed within specific kind of racial identities of languages. And, and one of the challenges when we look at the, the, the part of, of, of this, uh, of the Argentine society who constantly suffers racism is to trace their history of anti-racist action without necessarily looking for what we would understand as anti-racist uh, action. And, and, and Amosky has a lot of work on that. I think it's interesting to start like addressing both the, the how racial minorities or, 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 or groups that kind of organize around specific um, ethno-racial uh, identities with a long-standing history in, 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 in Argentina are countering this narrative, but also trying to look at that kind of other side of, uh, of, of, of the Argentine non whiteness who are not necessarily addressing the issue in, in, in the same way, but nonetheless, they are constantly, and perhaps they have been systematically countering that racism, but through ways that we uh, we might not think at first as anti-racist. So I want to, I will close with that. Thanks. Well, thanks the three of you for this fantastic um, exciting presentations. We have a, a lot of questions in the chat um, that I am trying to find. Uh, so now I think that we can do is to pick some of them. So um, 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 three of you can reply them uh, to, to enable a conversation beyond the, the presentation. Uh, well, 
there is there is a, a long question of Hechi that says, "Great talk, thank you. I just have a few questions. What do you sh what do the shift in nomenclature that were discussed from Spanish white novel Creole etc. tell us about the contrast of whiteness? Are there other dimensions of whiteness such as religion, culture, and economic and political orientation that have keep have kept and adapted over time? How does whiteness become an organizing principle of social relation in relation with indigenous black and Asian people in the Americas? If there is something missing in translation, will we translate blancura, blanquitud, blanco, and mestizo into English in terms of whiteness? And how can we address and specify the system in relation to the local context in Latin America? It's a big question if someone wants to address it. So, it's, it's a little too much. Sure, I'll, I'll try and tackle a few of them. Um, those are great questions. Uh, so I thank you for pushing this conversation forward. Um, thinking about the nomenclature in particular uh, from Spanish to Blanco, or noble, criollo, for example, um, in, in reference to indigenous peoples. Uh, what it tells us about whiteness is that it remains, at least for me, something that can be in flux, very flexible, and also one in which it ultimately allows for, and I think Ignacio really per, explained it very well, but it allows for those that are not physically at least, or at least would, would, would fit this notion of being a, a, um, from an, an immigrant and a European, it allows for the others to have some levels of whiteness and appreciation and, and or inclusion into a national narrative, although not quite. So there's you know, ways in which they can perceive or act or be where they live, um, how they dress, all these things come into to factor the notion of what is whiteness. And that's very much still part of the colonial period, at least from my perspective, where whiteness isn't just phenotype. Um, and so I think that's what we have to see, especially with the Republic, this shift to Blanco, you know, and I, I thank you, Ignacio, because it is true. You know, I rarely heard an Argentine proclaim proudly, it's just soy Blanco, you know, I've never heard that. And that is correct. But the use of the term Blanco, I think, was at least for that moment, a substitute for Spanish. And until, you know, we have an Argentine nation, we're looking at various republics, right? And so at least for in Cordoba, this use of Blanco then replaces or substitutes Espanol. Um, and, and Noble as well is also being used too. So you could still see that kind of connection to the colonial past. But definitely I think it's about creating a space then for those that were you know, formerly labeled indigenous or black, negro, um, and giving them some level of a space within this new or forming, in my case, for the Republic, the formation of, of, of a whitening uh, project, not quite there yet. So I think that's important to really look at what whiteness is and it continues to evolve and shift and mold. And even if we think about, you know, this notion of it being multicultural and this post-colonial type of ideology, this erasure, also of whiteness is important too to stress. So you see this notion of Blanco being eliminated over time along with Negro, along with this notion of indigenous and it becomes then the standardization of identity. And so other factors, which yes, definitely phenotype has plays a role, but also where you live, how much education you have, who are you connected to, all these also come, in, come as points of reference for understanding whiteness, ness being this kind of hazy grayish area that allows for some movement, I think is important to really, uh, that we continue to acknowledge that. Um, and one thing in terms of blancamiento, blanco and whiteness, I actually, I think it works. I think it allows again for that, um, for us to continue to 
to have that flexibility to see that it is a, a continuously evolving. And at this point right now, I think in many ways, Argentina wants to look at it as a class issue. I thought those examples from Ignacio were spot on, where here would have been an opportunity to say there are 10 white men against a person who is not white. Why are we not discussing race? But instead, it's let's convert this to class. And so the whiteness, I think it, 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 it provides for that flexibility. And so I, I agree with the, the use of that. Um, I just wanted to, I think that, um, I think Erica just kind of hit the nail on the head. I think that uh, it just made me sort of think about, um, this is also just, just even just outside of Argentina, this is just something that I see that um, in Latin America more broadly. I mean, so, you know, from slavery, um, in slavery, and just for example, in Brazil, um, it was sort of black, sort of negro was synonymous with escravo, slave. Okay, and branco was synonymous with free. Okay, so this kind of like laid the foundation for, I think what Erica is, or what scholars and in, particularly in, in Brazil are um, study sort of the, the, the whole notion of social whiteness um, that kind of comes sort of gets to start being sort of being thought about in the 20th century sort of after, after independence, after um, the abolition of slavery, um, but it's a practice that's happening during the colonial period that people sort of whiteness is something that um, is very, like you said, Erica, very flexible. Um, but then also there is this real sort of like racial reality. So what's interesting about Latin America, um, race and sort of the whole idea of whiteness is that it's always in flux, but then there's like, there's the actual physical reality of race, but then there's also this kind of social thing that's going on too. And I think that, you know, we all know that the idea of, you know, that race is a social construction, but it's really interesting that Latin America really shows us this, um, that uh, race really becomes this thing that becomes black or even whiteness, when we sort of think about, it becomes this thing that is very um, malleable in many cases, um, um, very, but then there's also a reality that is very physical that people live with. Um, and that 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 and and the people the people live live in their skin. And there is a racial reality, um, but there's this social dynamic that re becomes really interesting, and it becomes repackaged. I think I was thinking, you know, it becomes repackaged. It's really the same story, okay? Um, but throughout Latin American history, I was like, okay, this is the same stuff. All right, all right, we're just gonna like you know add in some commas and add in a semicolon here, but it becomes sort of repackaged. This whole idea of you know oh it's you know you know slave wipe no it's like you know if you're upper class you're not as you know you're not as uh black um all of this stuff comes from the colonial period um uh, and and people live this it's documented um it just evolves it gets repackaged over time it looks different but we're still it's a different conversation i think that's why we have to it's important that we're having these conversations um Ignacio, you want to say something about this question? Uh, should I keep? I think Erika and Lamonte said uh, uh, really everything that I thought I could say and more. So I think I'm, I'm, I'll pass. Great. Uh, Aurora brought two questions in the chat. Sorry if I'm missing the question because people are complaining. But um, one question is if you can't speak a bit about the waves of Asian immigrant groups, especially non light skin, uh, like Filipinos and Indus play in the role of colonization in Latin America. And also, I think she brought another question about if you could speak about col colorism uh, within uh, immigrants in Latin America. If someone has something to say on this issue. Um, I'm not a specialist in this. Um, um, there's some really amazing work that is coming out. Um, I mean, I, I mean, in, in the Brazilian case, um, uh, one of the, in the Brazilian sort of, you know, one of the, the largest, I think, most studied groups in Brazil is obviously the Japanese, um, the Japanese community and Jeffrey, historian Jeffrey Lester has a really wonderful book on that. Um, but what I can say to you, 
Um, it's really fascinating. And I, you know, if I had time, I would definitely write a book on, you know, Asian, <laughs> um, the debates around Asian immigration to Latin America. Um, I can tell you this, um, in the Brazilian case, um, when they were debating, when they were thinking about um, immigration, sort of, you know, when they were sort of transitioning from some debating slavery, the abolition of slavery, and sort of thinking about replacing the Black workforce um, with European immigrants, replacing the Black workforce, but also thinking about changing the racial landscape. Um, there were some people that put forth bringing, uh, bringing in Asians, um, uh, Asians, Chinese, um, uh, Chinese, Japanese, um, Filipino to Brazil. And um, it was not, uh, it was, there was, this was some of the most racist stuff I've ever seen. <laughs> um, they were not, it was not supported. Uh, it was not supported. And I, one of the, what, it kind of stuck with me. I read this about 10 years ago. Um, they were really terrified that um, the um, bringing Asians in would further, um, I, I think one of the, one of the, one of the senators at the time said, further pervert um, the Brazilian racial makeup worse than it already is. So they were already, there was a lot of very sort of racist um, dialogue about, um, and I think they were even saying that it would just make, they, they were worried about how like a mixture between Asians, Blacks and whites, what that child would look like, how it would just completely uh, mess up kind of the Brazilian aesthetics. There was some really, crazy stuff that was uh, being, you know, spouted out in parliament. So uh, Brazilians, I would say they definitely um, were um, in the in the mid 19th century, late 19th century, they were not in favor of Asian immigration for a number of different reasons. And particularly because um, they were, they wanted to be a Europe in the Americas. Um, Brazil wanted to be France, actually. Um, that was kind of like their aspiration. Um, they wanted to be in Europe and the Americas and Asia, a, the immigration or the importation of Asians, um, even though they needed to kind of replace this formerly slave, former slave workforce, they were not particularly keen to um, have Asians come into the country. So if I can say a little bit about uh, the Argentinian case, uh, Teresa Co has really good stuff about it. But uh, again, with uh, in the case of, of Asian immigrants to, to Argentina, particularly Chinese, Korean, South Koreans, uh, again, we have, this, we have this dynamic of invisibilization and, uh, and at times hyper visibilization. So they, they don't exist, they're, they're not part of the nation, they haven't done any contribution to kind of the development of the nation. But at the same time, we, we have very uh, clear moments in the past years in which there is this moral panic about Chinese supermarkets and the mafias and that they, or, or South Koreans who have uh, enslaved Bolivians and suddenly white uh, middle class Argentinians are concerned about Bolivians, which is quite uh, extraordinary, but they, that they have slave workers in, in, in uh, illegal warehouses and sweatshop, sweatshop, sorry. So there is again this, this very peculiar uh, dynamic in which they, they have been completely excluded uh, from, from, from the history of, of the nation. And, and, and at the same time, when it's required, they, they, be, they are everywhere and they're about to take over the nation, the world, et cetera. And I'll just briefly add, um, at least when it comes to the colonization process, um, when I was looking at the 16th, 17th century um, slave data uh, inform information provided and in the notarial you know, records of Cordoba, I did find a few instances of Japanese, at least they claim to be of Japanese descent that were enslaved. Um, Hapon, X-A-P-O-N was how they were um, described from being from so Japan. Uh, but it was very rare, but it still speaks to the inner um, American slave trade that took place. Um, Tatiana Sejas has written a book um, for your, about Asian slavery and Asian immigration during the colonial period to Mexico, which is a good book to also start. And actually I'm reading right now, um, Rethinking Race in Modern Argentina. And there is a chapter um, called Between Foreigners and Heroes. Asian Argentines in the Multicultural Nation. 
by uh, Chisu Teresa Ko. So there, it's begin. I, I would I would argue in many ways it's still a topic that is even less studied than even the Afro or Black experiences, but it's definitely necessary. Well, uh, we have a question, and I think it's is a good last question. It's of Carmen Baldivia. She said. We cannot speak of whiteness without mestizaje, whether biological or culturally. If we conceive whiteness as a destination, mestizaje has been the vehicle of transformation. Then the centering whiteness to acknowledge the coloniality, or more specifically, the our systems of this construction. My question to the presenters is, what can create exercise can we do as scholars implement in our own pedagogies to challenge whiteness in the academy beyond the diversity uh, principles uh, and they she said in the context of the u.s one example i have been thinking about is to consider the wideness of land acknowledgement i think the question is what we can do as scholars about it if someone wants to address Hmm. <laughs> Are we do something maybe that's the question <laughs> the question i think it has perhaps to uh, there are two ways of uh, that i could interpret the question one has to do with with our research and, and and our teaching practice in case of those of us who teach or research and the other one has to do with kind of structure of things right so if we're talking about land ownership that is has to do with the the, the material uh, base and, and 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 the way in which universities are embedded into wider uh, structures of racial uh, of institutional racism. So I don't know if the question has to do with. I guess both can be related, but it's difficult to to do it on the spot you know, to think how through our research practice we can. Uh, contribute to the, the structural regeneration or transformation or decolonization of the university system beyond the obvious that we are kind of contributing to creating awareness, to uh, um, promoting different uh, alternative ways of seeing things, of, 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 of uh, denouncing uh, racism, uh, creating perhaps a public conversation, etc. Thank you for that question um, or in, in comment, Carmen. I think that um, my my quick answer to your question would be: um, I would, you know, you said we cannot speak of whiteness without mestizaje, um, whether biologically or culturally. If we conceive of whiteness as a destination, mestizaje has been the vehicle for this transformation. I would say that even just um, what I'm, I'm even taking away from our presentations today is that, um, again, the further need to really expand our thinking around mestizaje, okay? So I was sort of thinking about sort of pedagogically, we need to understand, uh, one, we need to further unpack, again, like I said in my presentation, what does mestizaje actually mean, okay? And what did it mean in different historical moments? Yes. And I think that that's essential. We cannot talk about mestizaje, misijinasan. We have to talk about it specifically, okay? In specific historical moments, because, you know, I think as Erica said, it's always in flux, okay? So it's never, mestizaje is never just this one thing. So the language of race mixture, um, we need to be specific about that, okay? And I think that, and we sort of think about, we owe it to, um, we owe it to even the people kind of in the archives to be specific about that, okay? So it's, you know, and I think that we don't wanna reproduce, I think in our teaching, the same kind of violence that's been done rhetorically, discursively in Latin America um, by just essentially just putting everything in the pack of mesti sahe. We that's already been done. We need to be specific now. Um, we need to be specific. Um, we need to say we need to talk about mesti sahe in the colonial period. What kind of work was, was it doing? Kind of racial uh, work that it was. What's happening with mesti sahe or miscegenation or sexual violence? Okay, we need to name it. We need to name a lot of these things. We need. I I, I would urge you in your teaching 
to, to push towards specificity, mm -hmm. okay? We don't need to conflate, we don't need to conflate even just in the region, okay? In the region, there's something going on in Argentina, there's something different going on in Brazil, there's something different going on in Central America, there's something different going on in Cuba, and this adds richness to our conversation, okay? Um, so same stuff, oftentimes same discourse, same script, but there's a lot of different stuff going on. So I, I would urge you to push toward messy sahe. Um, think about messy sahe. Think about it, um, and think about specificity. How do we just? How do we name? It? How do we think about it in different moments? Um, and I think that that would be in our thinking and our teaching and our scholarship would be more productive. Um, so I'll just stop there. But more specificity and new scripts. That's what I would say. And I agree. <laughs> There's not much else to say after that. That's a mic drop moment, Lamont. I think that was perfectly said. Um, one little thing I noticed, and I was going to just go more into even just the differences between after sometimes what we say a school of thought. I found um, that those of us that do at times Latin America in the United States, it's hard for the for 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 those. Um, to see mestizaje prior to the early 20th century versus as I found with my Argentine colleagues that were screaming it's mestizaje from the colonial period onward. So having and making sure we have that conversation to remind ourselves, it's not just the regional differences, but also in how we study and think about this as well within the concept and cultures that we're living in today. But total mic drop. Yes, Lamont, you killed it. Wonderful. <laughs> well, we, we still have a lot of comments, but I think that we 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 can finish today and we can pursue the conversation through the events, the series of events that the institute is organizing. Again, thanks the three of you for, for coming, for generously sharing your time on your research with us. And um, well, this conversation then will be online for all of us once to come back to it. So this is the end of event. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. You can clap uh, <laughs> the presenters and <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Bye. Great Hi. to see you. Yes, yes. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for the three of you. I'm just I think we can finish now. Dang. Yeah, I just want to say it was a great conversation, Patricia. I really enjoyed this. So thank you so much. No, thank, thanks really for your time. I really learned a lot and it was super interesting. I just want to go and read more. <laughs> like, you're like, I'm definitely. Sure about it. Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, well, have a good oh, day. bye bye. Hope to bye -bye. see you soon.